Um, Implicit is a coming of age story about a teenage girl in southeast Missouri. <clears throat> In the years before my aunt's house was a house, it was a swamp. In the 1980s, Camden decided to expand its middle class suburban districts as far as it could push them. Over a period of two and a half years, the same ranch style house was repeated outward in a grid formation over land that once was wasted on grass and trees. At first, when they reached the swamp, or the marshland as it was later called, they believed they had found their natural end point. But the men who had initially invested in the project saw that they could squeeze money out of the marshland by building cheaper versions of the same house and selling them off for less. Thus, enabled by a move of brilliant corporate greed, the upper threshold of the working class found itself landed in houses with variable rate mortgages and fairly strenuous flooding problems. My grandparents bought a property then, and my grandfather spent the last 10 years of his life waterproofing the basement. I never met him, but on heavy rain days, I like to think we can feel a mutual closeness that mortality never afforded us, but the bonds of economic suffering might. I'm told my grandfather was an impressive man. I'm also told that in the long nights he spent caulking and recaulking cold cement walls, he was drunk as a birthday girl. <laughs> From what I can gather, he was neither a mean nor a happy drunk. He was a veteran, Korea, I think, and Aunt Gina says he drank to blur his peripheral vision in case it ever wanted to play a trick on him. I have to take her word on this. I only met his wife, my grandmother, a handful of times, and she wouldn't speak a single word about him. My mother wouldn't either. In the basement of Aunt Gina's house, summer always carried a certain smell, a mix of skunk spray and cat shit and mold. Even with all that perfect, detailed caulking, you could never escape the lazy, lingering smell of mold. It clung to the air like ivy in the lungs, creeping in and slowing the body. My, moon, my room in the tiniest corner of the basement was trying its best to freeze me to death. I ran my hand over an exposed section of leg. It felt hard and lifeless, like tanned hide or granite. Gina O'Leary always burned up like alcohol, saying her blood got lit on fire by all the Irish in it. And the vents upstairs puffed like breath while the vents downstairs blasted like metal hurricanes, so on the hottest summer days I froze. I put shitty torn up towels over stained cement floor because it hurt too much to walk on it straight, and I muttered bitterly about the thick shag carpeting in Gina's room and how my whole damn life was a fucking endurance test. And no shit I could do about it. Anyway, it wasn't worth the fight when it all came down to the same damn thing. Gina's red lips pursed and saying, why the hell should I support an ungrateful child like you when the state will do it for me? In August, I slept a lot. Today, I'd been asleep for the sunny hours, so when the alarm on my watch went off to remind me that Jamie was coming, I had mutated into a lump of hair tangles and dirty boxers. I rolled over and left the room. I didn't look pretty in Campton. Even when I put on makeup, I didn't know how to do it right. I could look like a slut, but I didn't know how to do it just to look pretty. All the other girls in town had been painting themselves since elementary school, so I never stood a chance. Anyway, the other girls were all celibate until pregnant Midwestern Lutherans. The only thing those boys cared about was getting a girl to fuck them, and even in bikinis, those girls still broadcast giant neon nose. So I didn't have to look pretty. <laughs> As I finished, I heard a car horn blare outside, echoing through the now empty house. I grabbed my messenger bag and climbed the stairs. Upstairs, Gina's five dogs slept like a pack of neutered wolves in the living room, one on top of another like fallen dominoes, cogs in a dog machine. I tripped over one of them and steadied myself on the back of the couch. For a moment, I was face to face with a graphic crucifix nailed to the wall. Gina's house was plastered with them, all the symbols of a religion my mother had abandoned and disdained before she died before she died, before she died. Thank you.